In this video, we're going to review some of the general chemistry concepts that you should know in order to be successful in this course. You should be familiar with the basic concepts of atomic structure. Specifically, you should recall that protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, while the electrons are found outside the nucleus in the electron cloud. In addition, you should recall that protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. You should also recall that the atomic number is the number of protons in an atom, and it defines what the element is. This is different from the mass number, which is the sum of the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Finally, you should recall that isotopes are atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons. In other words, they're atoms that have the same atomic number, but a different mass number. You should also recall the ideas of electron configurations, valence electrons, and Lewis dot structures. You should also recall what you know about bonding. This includes ionic bonds, which form between cations and anions. You should also recall that covalent bonds are those bonds that form between atoms that share electrons. You should also recall that covalent bonds can be divided into nonpolar bonds or polar bonds. The nonpolar bonds are bonds that form when the atoms have similar electronegativity values, while polar bonds are those that form between atoms with very different electronegativity values. You might want to review your general chemistry notes to refresh your memory about electronegativity values and the trends in electronegativities in the periodic table. You might also want to review your notes on the concept of hybridization, which includes sp, sp2, or sp3 hybridized atoms. It will also help if you recall from your general chemistry the idea of Vesper, or valence shell electron pair repulsion. This model will also lead you to review the ideas of bond angles as well as molecular geometry. Now that we've introduced some of the concepts that you should recall from general chemistry, we can apply some of those concepts to some new species that you'll see in organic chemistry. Specifically, we'll look at the methyl cation, the methyl radical, and the methyl anion. If you recall your Lewis structures, you may think that carbon generally has four bonds, and you would be correct. However, with the methyl cation, we see that the carbon is actually bonded to only three hydrogens. Since it's called a cation, we also know that it has an overall positive charge. We call carbons that have a positive charge a carbocation. We also want to remember that since the carbon only has three atoms attached to it, that it also has an empty p orbital. The methyl radical is very similar to the methyl cation, except that it now has a single electron in the p orbital. Any species that has an odd number of electrons or an unpaired electron is going to be called a radical. The methyl anion is more different from the methyl cation or the methyl radical. For one, it has a different geometry. While the other two species were trigonal planar, the methyl anion has a pyramidal structure due to the presence of the lone pair of electrons in the p orbital. Anytime we have a carbon with a negative charge on it, we call that species a carbanion. We also want to review the general structures of water, ammonia, and the ammonium ion, because these are three structures that we'll encounter quite a bit when we study organic chemistry, especially when we're studying organic compounds in aqueous solutions. Each of these species is sp3 hybridized because each species has four electron domains around the central atom. 
In the case of ammonia, each of these electrode do electron domains is a bonding pair of electrons because there are four hydrogens around the central nitrogen atom. In contrast, in water, there are two lone pairs of electrons and two bonding pairs of electrons around the oxygen. Furthermore, because each of these molecules or ions is sp3 hybridized, we also know that each central atom is going to have a tetrahedral electron domain geometry. When we look at water specifically, we need to pay attention to the fact that the oxygen-hydrogen bond is going to be very polar. And again, this is because the oxygen atom is the second most electronegative atom and the hydrogen is not nearly as electronegative. So the electron density is pulled much more greatly to the oxygen, leading to a partial negative charge on the oxygen side of the molecule and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen side of the molecule. In this course, we'll also be interacting with hydrogen halides. Hydrogen halides are simple molecules of the formula HX, where the X is any of the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. In general, the bond properties are going to depend on the size of the atom. And we know from our trends in the periodic table that fluorine is going to be a smaller atom and iodine is going to be the larger of the halogen atoms. So from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, those atoms increase in size. In looking at the bond lengths of the hydrogen halides, we see that the bond length is going to increase as the size of the halide ion gets larger. So that means that the hydrogen iodide bond length is going to be larger than the hydrogen fluoride bond length. On the other hand, we see that the bond strength actually decreases as the halide ions get larger. So therefore, the hydrogen iodide bond is going to be much weaker than the much smaller hydrogen fluoride bond. In this problem, we want to show the direction of the polarity in each of the indicated bonds. And in these three problems, the black arrow is going to indicate the bond that we're looking at. Now, even though this is essentially a review of a general chemistry problem, you should recall that the first thing you want to do is compare the electronegativity values of the two atoms that are in the bond. These values can be looked up by any table of electronegativity values. When we look up these values for fluorine and bromine, we see that fluorine has an electronegativity value of 4.0, while bromine has an electronegativity value of just 2.8. In comparing these values, we then see that the atom with the larger electronegativity value is going to pull the bonding electrons more strongly toward it which means that the higher electronegativity atom has a higher electron density and thus will have a partial negative charge. We can indicate this by writing a partial negative on the part of the bond for the atom that has a greater electronegativity value. On the other hand, the atom with the smaller electronegativity value is going to have a partial positive charge because it has a lower electron density around it. You might want to pause this video now and see if you can identify in this carbon-hydrogen bond which end is going to be partially negative and which is partially positive. And at the same time, you can determine if this nitrogen-oxygen bond is going to be polar, and if so, which atom is going to have the partial negative and which atom will have the partial positive. Now, if you got the correct values, you should see that the carbon has a value of 2.5 and hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1, so the carbon will be slightly higher electron density and will have a slight negative charge. In the nitrogen-oxygen bond, oxygen is the second most electronegative atom with a value of 3.5, whereas nitrogen has a value of just 3.0. So again, this nitrogen-oxygen bond will be slightly polar with the oxygen being slightly negative and the nitrogen being slightly positive.
Now, this relationship between a carbon and hydrogen is important because for organic chemistry, you'll see quite a lot of molecules with carbon-hydrogen bonds. As their electronegativity values are very similar to each other, even though we indicated the carbon is slightly negative, overall, most people would call this carbon-hydrogen bond nonpolar because of the similarity in electronegativity values. This is going to be important because one th rule of thumb that you'll learn is that in general, reactions take place where there's an excess or shortage of electrons. In other words, where there's a lot of electrons in a small space or there's a shortage of electrons in a small space. In this problem, we're again asked to look at the polarity of bonds, but in this situation, we want to rank each set of bonds from most polar, in other words, the largest difference in electronegativity, to the least polar, which would be atoms with the smallest difference in electronegativity. As before, we'll want to look up the electronegativity values for each of the atoms in each problem. In this first problem, we identify that carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.5, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5, fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0, and nitrogen has an electronegativity value of 3.0. Once we've identified the electronegativity values, we will determine the difference in electronegativity values, because as the difference in electronegativity values increases, the bonds become more polar. When we subtract the values, and we do this simply by taking the larger value minus the smaller value, we see that the CO bond has a difference of 1, the CF bond has a difference of 1.5, the CN bond has a value of 0 0.5, and the carbon-carbon bond, where the two atoms are the same, as we would expect, has a difference of 0. We can now rank these from most polar to least polar by putting them in order of the largest difference in electronegativity to the smallest difference in electronegativity. So the carbon-fluorine bond is most polar. Next would be the carbon-oxygen bond, and then the carbon-nitrogen bond, and finally the carbon-carbon bond would be least polar. You should pause this video now and then look up the electronegativity values for the atoms in parts B and C, and then rank them from most polar to least polar. If you've done the problems correctly, you should see that the carbon-chlorine bond is more electronegative than the carbon-bromine bond, which is in turn more electronegative than the carbon-iodine bond. For problem C, it should be clear that the hydrogen-oxygen bond is most polar, the hydrogen-nitrogen bond is somewhat polar, and the hydrogen-carbon bond is not very polar at all, with just a difference of 0 0.4.